Chris, it is, it's just such a joy to have you here. It's such a joy to um, be able to speak with you about this project. It has taken on a life of its own. This piece that you composed, the first social dances for string trio. How did you come about its inception? Um, how did you choose that instrumentation? Really just anything that you can tell us about when the work was written. Well, it goes back quite a long way. So in 1975, I was already a full-time bassoon player in a symphony orchestra in Toronto. So the music started out as piano music. I wrote four short pieces and I gave them to a friend of mine who recorded them for me. And in 77, about two years later, I decided to score it for string trio. Basically, the music was in three parts until the 2000s, I didn't think very much of this piece. It actually, I discounted its importance. Then I got this invitation from you last year. And this is very interesting because what you guys have done by being willing to play it and the choreographers to set it for ballet have really meant a great deal to the piece and to me. But then the ballet people said, well, we need a, we need a scenario. Tell me, tell us about the piece. But I had none. All I had was, <laughs> was there was a prelude and there was a scherzo and there was a duet and there was a finale. All of that is very, very dull and it doesn't tell any story. Well, what did I think about dance? And I came up with four titles for the movements. Will anyone want to dance with me? <laughs> is the first title. Now, this just think about your first experience with a social dance. You know, you're going to go to some, oh, either class or maybe it's junior high and you're all nervous and will anybody want to dance with you? And the second one is called Dance Class Disarray because if you do go to a dance class, you know, nobody's on the beat and, oh my gosh, how do we keep this all straight? The slow dance is just between two people it's a little duet, and it's slow, so you can be confident about your dancing. And the, fin the final work I call group celebration. Oh, we can finally dance, and they play, and it's a kind of umpa 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 piece, and it ends rather abruptly. So I say, the sudden ending might ask, is more to come? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So then we listened to it and then I, I showed it to our dance collaborators and they said, yes, this is something that we can definitely do. And, um, and then it, and then it developed from there. We were a, they were able to find choreography from, um, a, a choreographer from Ohio state, uh, studying dance there named Tian Jing. And she was just so spectacular and, um, and the whole collaboration came together and, and they were able to communicate with you to get that vision, yes. right? Yes. To get that vision for the piece. And I think, yes. I think they just did such an awesome job. I am giddy <laughs> with excitement about airing those four pieces. That's great because I'm also giddy because <laughs> I had discounted that piece. In my case, I had kind of set this aside. In fact, when I started to publish my own music. I didn't publish it, either the piano version or the string trio version. Mm. I just thought, ah, oh, it's too short. And, and I wasn't, re I really didn't know what I was doing, mm. this, that, and the other thing. So, but what's happened is I've discovered that it has more value and validity than I thought it might have. Watching it on ba uh, uh, with the dance gave me a, a perspective I had not had before. Mm. I've never experienced my music being used as a background for something else. Huh. And so you listen to it in a very different way. I'm very excited about it too. You've turned my head around. You talk about your work having validity and how, how much would you say that that conversation is a part of your creation process? The conversation about that is going on all the time. Mm. So I'm now in my 80s, and I began playing a musical instrument when I was in seventh grade, mm. so uh, junior high school. By the time I was in high school, I started to arrange music. And for the rest of my career, I created little pieces for special occasions, mostly arrangements. But then after a while, well into my 
professional career as a playing musician, I started to compose a little bit mm. and uh, gradually um, started to do that, but I was not confident about it. I was very much more confident about arranging sure. and transcribing. Then when I retired, I had a lot more time. I started to publish my own arrangements and transcriptions and compositions, what few there were, maybe a dozen, a couple of dozen mm. at the most. And now I now have enough time to really pay attention to it. So I'm an emerging composer in huh. my 80s. So as a consequence, when I'm writing music, I'm constantly figuring about where is this going to sit? Yeah. And in a sense, I'm still trying to discover my voice. That's a composer's word. And I have to, I, to try to define my music. It's classical music. It's acoustic music. It's not popular music in that respect. Mm -hmm. I hope to appeal to the inner emotions, which is what music is supposed to do. <laughs> it's reflective and reassuring music. It's, it's usually humorous. Mm. Uh, maybe the last movement of the string trio is humorous because what it is, it's umpa umpa umpa. You know, it's really <laughs> couldn't be more. Now, what is that doing in a serious string trio? And surprising. So those are the words that I would attach to some of my music. You know, you mentioning being um, an up and coming composer in your eighties. I don't. I don't know that there's anything more inspiring than that. I wonder if you have any advice for any any composer or musician who is has taking that step away from arranging towards composing or taking the step um, from musician to composer. I wonder if you have any advice for those people about you know continuing even though that conversation can be so daunting. It's a long process. It's a process of self discovery and to be confident about what you can do. The idea of being self confident and and trusting instinct. First of all, you have to write something. You have to sit there all by yourself in isolation. This is so interesting because everybody in the world has been isolated for quite some time. It's easier for me to write when I have a specific project in mind uh, and uh, take every advantage to compose, I would suggest to people. The other thing I would suggest is work your network. Uh, we live, my wife and I live in a lovely retirement community. And I've only just discovered that I've got a following here for my composing. I can't believe it, you know. Amazing. Because, yeah, these people are generally a little bit more uh, reserved and conservative than I am. But they will sit and listen to my music. And I'm grateful. <laughs> That's amazing thinking about the first social dances for, for string trio, what were some of the particular complications maybe you encountered while writing the piece? First of all, the notes and the rhythms between the piano version and the string trio version are virtually the same. Mm. Uh, so obviously in the back of my mind, as I was doing the piano version, uh, I was thinking instrumentally. The first uh, movement and the second movement are based on 12 tone writing. And that was very much the dominating force in the 70s, but I was not a strict interpreter of the rules. Mm. So you, would, you could say that this, the first two movements especially are quasi or semi 12 tone. The third movement, a little duo, one voice is playing the black notes of the piano and the other voice is playing the white notes and quiet and um, sort of a thoughtful little piece. Then the last movement, I use some uh, ninth and seventh chords. And as I say, it's umpa umpa. The bass line is based on the black notes of the piano and it's very tuneful. It, you can combine those black notes in almost any way and it always sounds pretty good. So that's what I did with that. I would love actually to talk about the third movement for mm a second because yeah. it's a it's a movement that I get to play as the violinist in the ensemble right. and um, that tonal relationship that that sort of half step relationship between the cello and the violin that then moves in different voices was something that was actually was was really powerful for my playing and for my listening and I think that there's this there's a really 
there's an, an intimacy there mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. that comes through, you know, we're, we're sort of circling one another and yet we can't meet. There's a tenderness mm-hmm. there. And I think it, without me even knowing, right, because you had your conversation separately with the dancers and I really, you didn't have any direction when it came to choreography or, or videography. Mm-hmm. I, I left that to those artists. And then when I saw the du- the duet, and um, I won't I won't give it away for the audience members, but there is a there is a separation between, um, you know the the two dancers, and I it was I was like immediately when I saw that I thought yes that that's right. was that's exactly. what I felt that's, that's right. <laughs> I felt the same way I thought boy these people really figured it out truly. That's another aspect of composing that's interesting to me. Um, the average person that hears music doesn't realize that a composer uh, has to divest themselves of the piece. It has to go out into the public and the composer doesn't own it. Now the performers take, take a hold of it and they do with it whatever they can. So the composer has to be comfortable with the idea that, oh, these people look at it quite differently. And the dancers, I thought the choreography was spectacular. You had mentioned what what felt like you were circling this conversation about trust. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, writing a piece of music and then letting it go. Were there any times, any pieces of music that you've written that you really struggled with letting go? Or has that always been kind of your expectation? You, you understood that that was a part of the process. The reluctance to let go takes place before I finish it normally. And then I think I'm fortunate because I can make a decision finally and say, okay, it's done and I'm going to send it out there. Mm-hmm. And then we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I wonder, too, with that idea of kind of continuing the creation even, even before it's ready to let out, I, w- I wonder how much of that experience you had this year. Was, was, was this year, was living in COVID kind of a more of an opportunity for you to sit with some of your ideas? Or did you find that you actually were, were creating more? I won't say that I was happy to have the shutdown, but it's what a composer or an author, a philosopher needs is a little bit of isolation and time to just think about stuff. Um, I was not as productive as I would have liked to be, Mm. but then that's the story of my life anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I resonate with that. Of course. Your your background as a bassoonist and your writing for wind instruments, I wonder what writing for string instruments is like. Well, I'm not as scared of it as I was. (laughs) Uh, I had a wonderful experience for 10 years of conducting the Central Ohio Symphony. I learned a lot about the strings at that time. Mm. And and I have a secret agent. My wife is a cellist. She is a very, very good cellist with a very, very good ear. So she helps me. Uh, I don't get out of the house without a color check, you know, on my outfit. Well, the music doesn't get out of the house, believe me. She gets to go through it. And sometimes I don't change it, and sometimes I do. <laughs> that's very valuable. So she's a string player. I'm really grateful. I'm, I'm so grateful to you for writing this piece. I'm I'm grateful to you for for spending this afternoon with me and having this really wonderful conversation and i just want to thank you for for being here and for taking your time with me i really enjoyed being interviewed i'm so excited for all three pieces to be performed on sunday i i think this is a wonderful program and now i I admit i might be a little biased but (laughs) i think this is just i I think it's a spectacular program i think the pieces fit together so well and wonderful i really can't wait i can't i just i'm so excited i can't wait so thank you so much for taking your time with me you're welcome